Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 555 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me, Please, and Other Stories. Publishers Weekly says, Visceral settings and robust characters will have readers marveling at how much Kirtley is able to fit into a limited page count. For SFF fans with no time to sink into a doorstopper, these concentrated doses of genre goodness will hit the spot. And Kirkus Reviews writes, Kirtley employs sharp, concise prose that complements his puckish sense of humor. The author's passionate voice breathes life into this wonderful array of tales. So again, the book is called Save Me, Please, and Other Stories. And it's available now on Amazon.com. And our guest today is Kyle Newman, director of feature films such as Fanboys, about a group of obsessed Star Wars fans who break into Skywalker Ranch, and Barely Lethal, about a teenage assassin who attempts to blend in at a suburban high school. Kyle has also directed music videos for artists such as Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey, and worked on various books and documentary films related to Star Wars and Dungeons & Dragons. And in this interview, we'll be discussing his new book, Lauren Legends, a lavishly illustrated hardcover celebrating the fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons. And now here's our interview with Kyle Newman. All right, so we're here with Kyle Newman. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so how did you first discover Dungeons & Dragons? Dungeons & Dragons. So it was probably the early 80s my older brothers were in boy scouts they were 10 and 8 years older my dad was the scout master and they would go off to boy scout summer camp and i would go visit them i was little at the time uh so they were probably in their teens and i was maybe five or six and they were playing a custom version using tsr rule set um of D &D that was indiana jones because indiana jones had just come out and they were really into that i just remember this energy around this game everybody was playing in these tents and I was too little to play. So I was <laughs> off to the side like Elliot and E.T. watching the older siblings play. And But I picked up the monster manual. I flipped through. I loved all the monsters, the creatures. That's how, kind of how I learned how to draw was Marvel Comics and, and D&D Monster Manual. Um, so years later, a few years later, I got into it. I was into D&D. I also played the Star Wars role-playing game, the West End game. I did GURPS, I did Ninja Turtles, Car Wars, the Palladium stuff. So a little bit of everything, but, but D&D was definitely on the menu. And then played more D&D as I got a little older, took a long break from D&D, and then came back to it in late 2014, right as 5th uh, edition was starting. And I had a, a little one-and-a-half-year-old, and I was just home. And I was like, what can I do at home? So I started having people over to come play Dungeons & Dragons. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, the first time I really got into D and D, there were older kids at camp who were playing it as well. There's just something about camp in the '80s, I guess, that was like a a vector yep. for Dungeons and Dragons. Absolutely. Um, and then the Ninja Turtles game. Actually, you know, my favorite uh, uh, tabletop role playing game growing up was the Amber Diceless role playing game. Uh, it was designed by Eric Wujic, and he also did that the Ninja Turtles game for Palladium. So, oh yeah. Yeah, it was a really great game. I, I loved it. I, you know, that was a fun system for me. GURPS, flexibility of GURPS. So we tried a lot of different style of, of uh, you know, a lot of different theme settings with GURPS and obviously everything that like West End and TSR were doing. It was a very vibrant time for games, you know, considering D&D exploded onto the scene in the mid 70s. But then at that point, there were a lot of imitators and a lot of really good game systems that developed on their own independent of D&D and its rules it wasn't just copying it it was trying to do something different or trying to explore a different aspect of how you could tell stories and RPGs so that was a vibrant time the early 80s mid 80s so do you have any particular memories of uh, of things that happened in those games the Star Wars game or the Ninja Turtles game any uh, adventures that you went on you know the Star Wars game was something we would do every week after school it was just my best friends all got together and we would maybe multiple times a week. It was just one of those things that just went on for years. It was like a little family. And it's hard to say one thing. I mean, we were just deep into it. Like we had our own base. We had, 
it was a whole ecosystem created. It wasn't just like a small story. It was a whole second life. And it was a very rich universe. And and that really, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So that also, knowing that, how developed that world was, it filled a gap when Star Wars was almost on the cusp of becoming a cult film. And it really expanded the universe. And it became the Bible for these people stepping in to do novelizations and coding what these characters' names were and what their backgrounds were. And a lot of that stuff did get carried over into the fiction line. So were you ever discouraged from playing D&D? Because I can remember we, you know, when I was in high school, we tried to get a D&D club going at our school and the school that just would not let us do it because they, I don't know, they thought the game was uh, satanic or, you know, somehow uh, nefarious. I didn't experience all those stigmas associated with the game as much as I've read about since. You know, I'm in production, post-production on a documentary about the history of Dungeons and & Dragons, and a big part of it is satanic panic and how different pockets of America and the world prohibited the game and burned the books. It wasn't so much that. It was f- fantasy itself. It just felt more niche at that point. Um, there, there was a, the same group of people that would get into any RPG were the same ones that wanted to play D&D. So it didn't have that. It wasn't the role-playing game barrier. It was more how many people are into playing role-playing games. Uh, it wasn't that, that D&D was satanic. It was more, did people have the understanding and threshold to the, the interest to play it? And did it seem like it was crossing the line of being too too nerdy? It was more more that. So D&D was just one of the ones we kept in the mix. I didn't feel like there was any, it wasn't singled out in any particular way as being off-limits. Well, it must have been different for you two having two older brothers who were both into D&D. And if my research is correct, um, both your brothers became sort of artists slash animators. And I think you did sort of arts. I guess maybe you mentioned you did art stuff as well. So is that correct? My, yeah, my, well, my oldest brother, is a, he's a doctor, and um, but he's also a painter. But he, it's more on the side. Uh, my, my second oldest brother, he's head designer for Simpsons. He designed Futurama, Family Guy early seasons he's worked in illustration and animation for a long time so that it's kind of in our family um and then i you know learned how to draw and paint doing all of that and was could really paint in a classical way at a very young age but i just wanted to go to school for film so i kind of put all that aside um to focus more on that which i feel like films this ultimate uh amalgamation meeting of all these different vocations, art, artistic vocations. I love them all converging into to one medium. Mm-hmm. You went to NYU film school? Yes, NYU uh, film school. And it was amazing. I, I loved it. Great experience and great community of people. And then you did one of those, those Coca, you see sometimes at the beginning of uh, movies, they have those Coca-Cola little ads made by, um, Aspiring filmmakers, you were you, you were the first one, is that right? Uh, yeah, I was the very first one to win the uh, Coca Cola Refreshing Filmmakers Awards. That was uh, 1998, and I was still in college, and that really helped jumpstart career because there was this little short film I made. It was a minute long that ended up on twenty thousand screens, and um, gave me a good entry point into. The business, but as you know, everything is. You think you think you're like, oh, this is great. Everything's <laughs> sorted. You know, this entire business is a struggle. You're never safe. You've never made it. You constantly have to keep putting yourself out there. It's it's traditional freelance, but it's even more cutthroat. <laughs> so that was a great launch launching point, and it was a huge opportunity. Uh, you posted on Twitter recently, you, you're talking about your first uh, feature film, The Hollow. You said, uh, I took over as director on day four of production, having never read the script. Crazy experience. Yeah. So I was uh, in Los Angeles pitching actually an animated film. And two friends of mine, Hans Rodionoff was the writer and Mason Novick uh, was a producer. And they called me up one morning, it was Sunday, and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know flying home tomorrow and they're like no you're not come meet us at starbucks so i I go to the starbucks on a sunday morning and they are like we need you to come to set our director has quit the movie's fully financed you can take over we need someone to go shoot the movie 
let's go. And I was like, oh, I need to read it. And I, no, no, we're going to set now. Go. <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding. And sure enough, outside the door was a white minivan, a white van parked waiting to go to take me to set. So I had to just jump in the car and go. And I never read the script. After the first couple of days, I had no chance. So I was just getting sides on set and it'd be like, oh, scene 73. And I could see it was between 72 and 74. I got a little bit of those scenes. And I know there's 100 and maybe 20 scenes in the movie. And I was like, okay, we're getting close to the end of act two, I guess. So you just start piecing it together based on the information I have. Because I didn't, I literally couldn't sit and read a script for an hour and a half. I'm on set and it's go, go, go. So it was um, an insane baptism by fire. It was, you're just right in it. I didn't know the crew. I didn't know the cast. I didn't know why anyone was, was cast. I didn't pick anyone <laughs> that's on my team. Yet I'm in charge. So I had to, you know, grab this production by the scruff and kick it into shape. It wasn't in good shape. But like I said, it did have a good cast. We had Kaylee Cuoco, we had Kevin Zegers, there were some veterans, Eileen Brennan, who had won an Academy Award from Clue, Stacey Keach, Judge Reinhold, Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys. It was fun. But it was a it was a smaller independent movie trying to be Amblin Amblin esque. Yeah, so so I watched it this week, and there was there was one scene I was curious to ask you about. Maybe you know which scene I'm talking about, but there is a uh, a sex scene that involves decapitation, and I was just curious, uh, like what kind of discussions were there around that scene, or like did everyone think it was uh, awesome, or did uh, were there any uh, reservations about it, or kind of how did that go down? There were a lot of reservations, and I was kind of thrust into the middle of that. That was, I think, on day two. <laughs> oh my god so oh my god i didn't even know that was coming and um yeah i think you know the producers wanted it in i don't know if the the actress she started to change her mind on it but ultimately we we worked it all out it's yeah it was um there was a lot of things in that movie i probably wouldn't have done if i was in charge from the outset but you're in production you can't just stop and rewrite that's not the phase you're in and how I also like to run sets is normally to figure all those types of problems out ahead of time. So by the time you're there, all you're doing is nailing what you planned and hopefully trying a few new things as opposed to rethinking your reason for being there. So that's one of those lessons you learn on a movie like this, where um, going into things on my own after that, it was so you avoid any, any, anyway, you figure out all those things in advance. If there's anything that's left for discussion, you don't have time because every minute you're stopping on the set is thousands of dollars. So, yeah, it was. I haven't seen the movie in a long time, <laughs> but um, I I would say it's it for me. It's like one of those personal victories when I when knowing what I went through to make that movie. Um, I ultimately never really got paid. I got pneumonia. I had to keep going to set. I I had to become the most passionate person there just to finish this thing that I, it became my quest to do it, even though, you know, a week prior, <laughs> I didn't even know it existed. So, um, but I think that's how you have to approach all things in, in this business. You get an opportunity and you just have to do whatever you can to get it over the line. So, yeah, there's a lot of things in that movie that were, um, you know, probably wouldn't happen now and would have been scripted differently. But um, I think everyone had was fine with it at the time and everyone had fun with it. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of got you out to Hollywood then, that doing that project? It did. I was visiting, I was going back and forth, um, still based on the East Coast, but I would come out to LA and try and, you know, get projects into existence. And that helped. I still, you know, had to coexist on on two coasts after that fanboys i would say is the movie that helped me firmly stay out in the los angeles area um but that was a big a big step was the hollow uh so when did you you, you mentioned that you started you sort of rekindled your love for dungeons and dragons so where did that happen in this chronology did that happen before or after um fanboys i was always into D D. i would check up on it uh, I just didn't really have anyone to play with. Um, and I, probably because I was so focused on starting a career that you just don't have that type of 
leisure time. You really never do unless you force yourself to have that leisure time. That's that's what I've discovered later. Uh, I didn't get back into D&D until, like I said, like end of 2014. And I'd been playing Star Wars role-playing game, and our, our game master was Sam Witwer, the actor, and he was leaving town to work on a project, and he had um i didn't want to do another star wars group so we we all were like let's try dungeons and dragons it's back and that's how we we revisited it and ultimately you know sam became a a co-author on all the books and his brother also a co-collaborator on all the books so it's it all started from the uh, star wars rpg you know me and sam playing that and then me knowing his brother peripherally and then asking him if he wanted to work on a book about dungeons and dragons and that's how art and arcana happened yeah, so why don't you tell us about these books? So there's Art and Arcana, and if people are interested, I uh, interviewed uh, your co-author, Michael Whitwer, about that book in episode, I think this I have it here, 331. Yeah, 331, if people want to find out more about that. Um, so you did Art and Arcana, and then there's your new book, um, Lore and Legends. So you want to talk about kind of Lore and Legends, how that came about, and just uh, introduce it for people? Yeah, so Lore and Legends is a... It's a modern history book. It's on the current iteration of the game, fifth edition of the game, which launched in 2014, and it's still being you know publishing now. Uh, in 2012, they started a play test uh, at the tail end of fourth edition to figure out what might be the next edition. And in that, there's 175,000 people played the game, and they tried revisited all these old editions of the game to really distill down to the core of D and D. What what is D and D? What are the, the basic elements? And even if they're strange. Or they don't make sense. Sometimes that still is a core tenant of the game. And so they they obviously had a pretty good grasp on that. And they felt out fandom and said, what works? What doesn't work? What do you want to see? And they really listened to people. And that's how 5th edition found its origins. And this book explores D&D being nearly extinct in the early 2010s up to you know now where you've got 50 60 million people playing the game and it's a household name again so how did they go from you know two or three million people playing to 60 and there's a confluence of things including mass media stranger things rick and morty you've got D D on all types of television shows community big bang theory etc and it's Talk shows are talking about it. It had returned to the zeitgeist, and and there's several things. There's actual play. There's the critical role explosion, which contributed. There's a tremendous rule set that contributed to it. There's the ease with which one can learn how to play D anD. d So you can go online to YouTube and you can watch people play, and suddenly this game, which seems so complicated or taboo, you're like oh, it's just people together getting together and telling a story and having fun. What's what's weird here? So we explore all those things in this book. And on top of that, there's 900 images, which we're curating out of 90,000 images to try and take you through it almost like a yearbook. These are the highlights. This is how it happened. These are the voices bringing it to life. These are their their influences and what they're bringing to each setting or each storyline. And so much of 5th edition is a look back to the past. So much of it is... They're standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before, and they're using these characters, Van Richten and Tasha and Xanathar, and it's all Morden Kane, and they're all people that weren't invented for 5th edition, Aserak. These are people that were in their lexicon of villains and heroes that are cover stars again, and they're finding new ways to make them relevant for a modern audience. So if you've never played it, it's exciting, and you get into it, and you learn about the character, but if you have played it, then you you know that, you know, Xanathar is not invented for Xanathar's Guide to Everything. He's a character that's been around for a long time with deep history and water deep and beyond. So it's a real, it's dense. I mean, it's, that's what's great. We, 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 we pack a lot into 400 and something pages and that's what we're very proud of. It takes a lot of planning, designing intellectually and, and graphically and, uh, a really great team, and I think we are very proud of the the information and the experience that the book covers. It's a very good sequel to Art and Arcana. If you read Art and Arcana, um, that has a little bit of everything in it, and I feel like this book does too. We didn't just want it to be modern D and D art. There's still ephemera and moments captured, and 
toys and licensed products and things be, beyond just what Wizards of the Coast produces. And I think that tells the complete story of D and D, and they really do sit perfectly side by side. <laughs> and I think if you've read the first one, you 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 should check out the second one. It, it's um, a great sibling. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really cool. And I mean, I've played, uh, you know, when I lived in New York a couple of years ago, I played a fifth edition campaign. Rajan Khanna uh, was our dungeon master who our regular listeners will know. Um, but he was a homebrew campaign. So I was sort of a little bit aware of all the published adventures, but I just sort of maybe seen them in the store or something. So I didn't know a lot about them. So I, I really found out a lot reading this book and it really made me jealous uh, of, of people who played through all those adventures as they were coming out and everything, because uh, they really sounded cool, um, you know, based on the descriptions in the book. See, I played a lot of them. I played almost all of fifth edition. So I was kind of like the go-to person for helping navigate what's, if you're looking at a story, say you're looking at Icewind Dale and you have, you know, 80 or 90 paintings and illustrations, you could pick out, you know, any of them are great, but it's like, what are the ones that really, all right, this game is about isolation. This game is about psychological terror. Like you have to curate your three or four pages in the book that are, that are um, earmarked for Icewind Dale. And you have to be, you know, very ruthless about what makes it in. So people that have played it go, Oh yeah, it's, it's, you're bringing to the surface exactly what the feeling of that horror was in that book. Whereas if it's a madcap adventure, it's like, it's a different type of art that should really indicate that. And then when you put these books all together in our book side by side, you, you really feel the, the eclectic spectrum of tones and stories and genres that, that coexist within the D&D, the overarching umbrella of their multiverse. And that's that was one of the fun challenges, is that curation. Like you're walking through a gallery of, of Dungeons and & Dragons and you know what is going to speak the most to distilled down essence of each book because you only get a few pages to spend with each one. So having played most of these, I, I felt like I, I could help navigate and say, you know, this is what I know resonates with people. This one with resonated people playing the game. This one is a little bit more of like a side joke. You know, it's not as central. So that that experience of having um, as a player or a dungeon master gone through much of 5th edition, I think, helped shape the the type of art that was included. So when you're, you're saying you played all these 5th edition adventures, was that with um, Joe Manginello's group? Is that is that the group you played mm -hmm. through them with? No, I have another group we started. It was our Tuesday night group, um, which between that and playing with Joe in that group. And then I played in another group with Joe was another night. So it wasn't just the War of Dragons group. And we also played through um, some other adventures, including Mad Mage. Um, but it was a, a similar pool of people that would come together to play a lot of the stuff. But I would say mainly it's our Tuesday night LA Dungeons and Dragons Society group that um, got to dabble in a lot of these um, core ones. We didn't really make it to the magic uh, setting stuff and kind of past two or three years we haven't been able to play um, as much. We're still kind of, we're still catching up, but a lot of the 2014 through 2020 stuff we got to uh, play through. So you're playing in, did you say you're playing in three different weekly D and D games for uh, for about a four or five year stretch, yeah. Wow, that's pretty hardcore. It was, um, yes. I think that the pandemic also aided that too, and that's that's how we kept some of these things going. Even in the War of Dragons, the game with Joe and that whole team, at one point we were playing that one twice a week during <laughs> uh, peak peak pandemic. People had nothing to do, and they were they were just begging to keep playing. Do you, do you want to explain a little bit more about Joe's game for people who might not know? I mean, you talk about it in the book, but this is sort of this uh, celebrity uh, group of D&D &D players. Yeah, the group just kept getting bigger. I mean, um, you know, we were a few sessions in and then I think, uh, you know, Tom Morello joined the group and then a couple more sessions in and then uh, Dan Weiss, you know, co-creator co of Game of Thrones and then Dave Benioff joined and the big show would fly in, the WWE 
now AEW wrestler. He was flying from Florida. Vince Vaughn joined the team. Um, it was a very fun and boisterous group of people that just, you know, it was like we were kids again. You know, everyone was just having a blast. It was fun, simple way to kind of escape. And everyone had this similar origin story about how they, you know, when and how they experienced D&D when they were kids. And we all came from all these different places across America, yet it was a big part of all of our lives. So there was that bond and Joe was the dungeon master and he's a tremendous dungeon master and he does his research and he takes it very seriously and it's you know masterful storytelling and the group takes it all very seriously and they bring their their a game and it was a it was a really great game there's a, a story on variety people could look at where there's a video of what what joe's uh dnd room looks like tom morello describes it as a wine cellar slash dnd adventure cathedral uh it's pretty cool. There's also it's pretty funny in this um in this clip because Tom Morello says that apparently Joe has every D and D miniature or you know a map set or whatever in existence, and that if any no matter what happens the adventure, uh, Joe can always just pull out some you know some miniature or something that that matches that situation exactly. Absolutely, you'd be like, oh, we have we a, a wear shark, and you'd be like, I've got <laughs> six of them. You know, like no matter what it is, there is a mini to complement the the character so it was a whole menagerie of minis of all types sizes beautifully painted it was a, a pretty impressive collection <laughs> and so your character is Kalatur Minmax so tell us about him oh it's a half orc zealot barbarian um it was, I hadn't played the Barbarian before. It was just a fun change of pace. I'm normally attracted to, to the magic users, um, traditionally wizards or druids. And I loved playing uh, this, this kind of no frills Barbarian. It was a, it was a good balanced group, but there was, it was fighter heavy at first, I would say. And so um, he was definitely a frontline character with a lot of uh spirit and attitude it was definitely a you know the min max thing is something people some people frown upon in the world of D. um the irony was he wasn't a min max character really he was just a standard you know point by kind of thing and it, he wasn't really <laughs> overly strong in any particular place but um it was a yeah and they made a miniature out of him whiz kids actually hmm. put out a line of miniatures associated with the war dragons game and there was two box sets and so that miniature of my character was produced which is cool to have him in plastic and um yeah that came out i think in 2021 or 2022 uh so these great box sets of characters based on all the you know the 12 characters in our group yeah i'll just explain for listeners so min maxing if you don't know is when you sort of calibrate your character and things in order to get the biggest bonuses according to the rules rather than you know really role playing the character and what would make sense for this character or for or for the story or something so so it's kind of a little in joke that you named him Kalatur min max yep. yeah it was a yeah it was i tr keep trying to get the the min max name into some D, &D literature we have um <laughs> in the first cookbook you know we tell some lore and there was an opportunity to mention a tribe of half orcs. I think I kept putting it in there. And I think maybe the other guys cut it out. I'm not sure <laughs> if it made it into the final text, but um, one way or another, I'm going to get the the, the min max tribe, the northern plains of uh, Faerun into into canon. Mm -hmm. So is it sort of like a, a fun, like humorous sort of uh, campaign that you play, or is that just sort of like a uh, a little joke that, uh, and otherwise it's a really serious sort of, uh, oh, it's, a, it's a very serious, I mean, there's comedy in it. It has every emotion in it. It's very funny. It's also very dark. It's serious. It gets brutal. It's also uplifting and charming and light. It has a little bit of everything at its core. It's a grounded, serious world, but there is room for comedy. That was just a name play thing. It really wasn't a sort of factor or like an indicator of the tone of the, 
the game though. Uh-huh. It also says that um that uh Joe's character Arkin the Cruel has started showing up in uh in actual D and D uh source books and stuff, and that he's uh, he's been a story consultant for some of that stuff. Yes, I believe he has. Yeah. And so what was that what was that like uh, seeing characters that you played with kind of showing up in the official D and D stuff? Um, that was cool. I mean, our, we didn't really play with Archon. That's not a character that was in that game. Since oh, because he was, he was the master. DM, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that wasn't one of his characters. But another game, he, he, there's another character he's he's played that um, I think he's made a mini out of, and I think has been mentioned in canon. Um, and then an, uh, a different game we played. Um, we were doing the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, and Archon, the character, is in that book, and that's one of the ones he consulted on. And um, for our one of our final sessions, Archon shows up because he's in the book, and Joe came and actually played Archon in our home game. So that was cool. Hmm. You mentioned the cookbook there. Do you want to talk about the – there's actually two cookbooks you have out now, right? So there's two cookbooks. There's Heroes Feast, which came out in 2020 which is the official Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. And that was uh, written by myself, Michael Whitwer, and John Peterson. And then, which came out earlier this week, is Heroes Feast Flavors of the Multiverse, which is a planet-hopping, setting-spanning uh, narrative that links these seven chapters together. And it also underpins the, the food and the settings because we're going from the Forgotten Realms to... Realm Space and the Rock of Brawl to Salamnia to Ravenloft to Sigil to the Feywild and the Shadowfell. So you're really getting this incredible cross section of the D&D multiverse. And there's a, a narrative thread linking them all. And within each chapter are, is food germane to those settings, which should hopefully help activate your, your game night. If you're playing a game and it's in Planescape and you can go tap into the, the Sigil menu and put stuff on the table that's appropriate or if you're doing a dragonlance campaign we have you know food from salamnia and and beyond so we wanted to be a testament to how you know diverse the D D multiverse had become and it's beautiful i mean it's almost 80 recipes there is exquisite photography and food styling on top of that there's photography that captures these places that isn't about food and trying to bring to life places like Shadowfell or or the planet Crin. Um, we got to shoot at a real castle in Northern California vineyard that has a, a medieval castle on its property uh, with its own dungeon and everything. So <laughs> it was a next level cookbook and it made sense. If you're going to do a sequel to something, you have to do it bigger and better. You can't just retread. And that was something I was always adamant about. And I think since the first book was published, I was like, okay, for the sequel, we're going to shoot at this castle and everybody rolled their eyes. <laughs> I was like, no, if we're going to do it, we're going to do this. And I was like, okay, sure. And then as it really materialized, I was like, okay, well, you promised me we would we would go to this castle. And 10 Speed was incredible, and they they made it happen. And people that pick up the book, people that, even at Wizards are like, this book is gorgeous. Like, this is one of those beautiful books that anyone's put out. And we, again, curate it very well. We're very specific about what goes in the frame along with the food and also how these settings are depicted. So there, there's a veracity to it that if you, if you are immersed in these worlds, you should pick up on and, and, and respect that we're trying to respect these places and do justice to them and not just stick a title on something. Mm. I heard you say in an interview that for one of the books, Michael Whitworth had actually cooked every single recipe in the book, kind of one after the other yes. to test them all out. Yeah. Michael has battled through both books doing <laughs> that. I've tried, I've cooked or tried a lot of it. I don't think I've done every single one. I also don't really drink. I like the way the book, the, the drinks look colorful, exotic, sometimes glowing. Um, I'll try the the non-alcoholic versions of them if appropriate. Um, but you can also, you can conceive of stuff. I, I really work on the conception of these things, like a combination of this, this, and this, and it should look like this, and this is what we're going for, without having to um, be a drinker myself. So I'm I'm very proud of the, the drinks so selections 
in these books, as well as the desserts and stuff, which really try to activate D&D holidays. Um, and D&D, there's all these different worlds with their own holidays and all these different cultures with their own traditions. And a lot of the book is not just about the food, but it's about the lore and the traditions surrounding the people and the food. Um, that's what's cool. So the book, it is a cookbook, but it also is a source book of sorts for the cultures and, and settings. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you're working on a D&D documentary. Like kind of what's the current status of that? Okay. So D&D documentary is the official 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons documentary for E1 and Hasbro. I am co-directing that with Joe and producing it, exec producing it. And um, it's John Peterson, who's involved in all these books, is um, also involved. Michael Whitworth is in the doc as well, as is John. And it's a look at the phenomenon of D&D from its inception, birthed out of wargaming um, and tabletop and this you know little community up in Lake Geneva and Minneapolis and how this game that started in Midwestern basement became a global phenomenon and how it nearly died multiple times and resurrected. It gets into the satanic panic. And it looks at the, the modern movement and why the game is what it is today and how it's birthed a generation of storytellers and showrunners like Craig Mason and the Game of Thrones uh, creators and beyond. And we sit with everybody from Stephen Colbert to Tiffany Haddish, you know, to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, its influences them as people and as, you know, creatives. Um, I mean, it's it's literally you wouldn't believe all the people. It's like everybody Moby is in it, and Vince Vaughn is in it, and you know, it's a uh, Kevin Eastman who found, created the Ninja Turtles, and it's Ernie Klein, Ready Player One. So all these different people from all different walks of life coming together to talk about how this game um, set them on a career path in entertainment because a lot of dungeon mastering it's like show running, um, and we you know meet with the people who painted the books and illustrated and the people who wrote the original things. And we talked with Gary's family and, you know, all the, the old TSR stalwarts. It's a lot of news footage. It's this incredible, um, dense look at how this American art form was birthed and how the phenomenon grew. And it's, it's eye-opening in so many different ways. Just, the, just the the incredible, you know, spectrum of people on showcase expressing their love for D and D. Um, so that's in post production right now, and it should be out next year for the anniversary year. I saw in an interview you said you interviewed Tanahazi Coates for the D and D documentary. So it was, yes, was that as well. Um, I didn't actually conduct that that interview. So what's great is there was an there was an older documentary, and John Peterson was involved in that one, as was um, Adam F. Goldberg, who's one of the exec producers. And that documentary never came to fruition. And John, when Art and Arcana uh, came out, I was like, we should do a documentary. And he said, well, I am involved in this one. It's been stalled for two or three years. So we partnered with that filmmaker to acquire his library of unused interviews and Coates was one of the the many awesome ones that was in that library and so as much of the new material we shot there were still opportunities to um mine this footage that was there from old interviews uh from a few years back so that's how he appears in it and it's he's just got some really beautiful insights into the power of words and the power of role playing and how it you know transformed him as a young boy growing up in Baltimore. Yeah, no, it's really cool. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of how the thing has um evolved and come together. I think if you've ever interacted with D D, you'll be you'll be blown away by you know the the, the just the incredible cross section of creatives that have kept this the birth the game or became a steward for the game shepherding into these new eras of existence so here we are almost 50 years later next year's the 50th anniversary and the game is as vibrant and relevant as ever and so it took a a family of people a legacy of people a lineage to um 
understand the tradition and continue it. And so that's what we really get into. So you understand like this is a game not just made by one man. It's and it survived because of the people who play it and the people who love it. Yeah. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, I really loved the Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves movie that came out recently. Uh, Michael Whitwer actually was yeah. on the show to discuss that. And my understanding is that not enough people saw it to, for there to be a sequel, which I was really disappointed about. I was just curious, what, what, are you, what do you think about that? And is there anything that D&D fans can do to try to sort of make it more likely that there will be a sequel to that movie? Um, I think if people express their love, they they people always respond to that. I think the movie did fair. Um, it wasn't the quality of the movie was incredible. They you know you look at its you know, Rotten Tomatoes critically, it's loved. Everyone that saw the movie really enjoyed it. I think it was just the studio made a mistake releasing a movie. They pushed it a month and backed it right up to Super Mario, which was the biggest movie of the year until Barbie. So. Why they did that, I don't know. When they had a clear path at March and they pushed it to the end of March to go head to head with a, a giant video game property, kind of a poor business decision. Uh, it's not down to the filmmakers. They made a great movie. The cast was great. The energy was great. The reviews were great. Um, all of that stuff sets up the potential for a sequel. I wouldn't say it's not happening. I don't know for sure, but I, I would say it's dead either. Who knows? Um, but all of the things that were in the control of filmmakers went well. They made it. They made a good movie, and people liked the movie. Um, was it marketed correctly? Was it released at the right time? That's out of their hands, and that shouldn't be a determinant in if you make a sequel or not. You just find a better window to release it and do more of the same. So hopefully, they make another one. Um, but again, you never know. The strike may have had an effect on some of these things positive or negative maybe they're like well we know this this is good we've lost a half a year let's just get rolling on a sequel who knows um the filmmakers are really really talented writers very nice guys and great directors i i think um gotten to know them and i i, I hope a more people discover their movie and b they make uh another film so we can explore that on on screen a little more because i think it was a good a good calling card for D and D. Yeah, no, I thought it was fantastic. And just to give you an idea, you know, I, I went with it. Uh, I went to it with my wife and my in laws, and they were like, you know, sort of suspicious of D and D when we started playing years ago. They're like, if anything <laughs> doesn't feel right, you just get out of there, you know. So, just to give yeah. you an idea where they were coming from, and they and Call they loved the, the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just the idea that you know the movie could um, appeal to like hardcore D and D fans like, like me. And then also to people who know nothing about D and D and, or maybe even a little bit, you know, suspicious of it or whatever, you know, it's just, just really says about how, um, how broad its appeal is. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be honest. Like in my own playing group, it was a, a mixture of opinions and there's people that want their D and D to be violent and serious and brutal. And there's people that want their D and D to be fun. And there's people that, you know, they love the critical role side of things they love that kind of camaraderie. They're not as obsessed with the, you know, combat and stuff. So D and D means a lot of different things, depending on who you talk to. And you're never going to please everyone. But but I thought for what they set out to make, they made a very good version of that type of story. And for the most part, everyone I went to see with or saw it, like really liked it. Uh, there's a few people like ah, it should have been more like Game of Thrones, like. Uh, okay, <laughs> but there is something called Game of Thrones, so go watch that and shut up. You know, like not everything has to be like the other thing you liked just because they both have swords in them. Um, there's a very infantile way of approaching media. That's the way studio think, studios think, and that's also the way audiences, unfortunately, think. You, know, you look at the original Star Wars movies, were so explosion of fresh air in 70s cinema and then you look at the prequels and everyone's like hey wait a second this isn't exactly the same i don't like it and you're like wait a second it shouldn't be the same they're 20 years prior and there is no han solo because he's the voice of what's happened after 20 years of oppression there's a reason there's a character like that so it doesn't make sense to go stick han solo in the prequels so if you really understand the material and you understand the filmmaker then you understand the choices that they make. That said, yeah, there's things that would change in the prequels. There's probably things that would change in the D&D movie if I was the one making it. But as a fan experiencing it, you know, I understand 
why they're doing the things they're doing. And it's hard to please everyone. And when you're making tentpole movies like that, you know, you have to please as many people as possible or else it's deemed a failure. It doesn't make money. And every other shortcoming will be pinned on the fact that, you know, it didn't, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So you, you, you hope it makes money and then you're vindicated. Otherwise everything gets, you know, triple analyzed. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was a fantastic comedy movie. I mean, I, I would like to see a, a serious, you know, violent uh, D&D movie, you know, like a serious Dritz movie or a serious Dragonlance movie. Or uh, I was just saying, like, I, I would love to see just a, a movie where characters, you know, a bunch of heroes fight a beholder and it's all just serious and dark and dramatic and scary. And so I would love to see that. But I just thought that for what the movie, like you said, what for what the movie was trying to do, it just succeeded spectacularly. Yeah, totally. It was fun. I saw it three times, I think, you know. Um, my kids liked it. And that, that's always a good litmus test. You know, at the time they were seven and nine. And they loved it. So, I mean, that's really probably who they're trying to ingratiate um, and appeal to. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Star Wars there. And I saw you have a, a, another Star Wars documentary that you're kind of um... – like touring right now or taking to festivals, uh, a disturbance in the force. Yeah. So a disturbance in the force is actually, yeah, it's coming in theaters end of November. Uh, Alamo draft has, has putting it out domestically. There's going to be a screening at the, the Prince Charles cinema in London on November 16th. And it's at doc NYC in mid November as well. Uh, so that's the tail end of like the, the festival. It's then coming to um, VOD and beyond in December, perfectly time for, the holiday is the best way to experience the Star Wars holiday special. And uh, the doc is, it's awesome. Um, it's a very straightforward, no frills, unpretentious, fun, honest look at Star Wars holiday special from the people who made it. Writers, directors, producers, people internally at Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox at the time, the cast, um, you know, costumers, dancers, everybody that was a part of this thing, even has Pete Sears from Jefferson Starship, who was in it. Um, we talked with Donnie Osmond, who the Osmonds got to play with Star Wars in the 70s as George was trying to find ways to keep Star Wars relevant and put it on on television in order to keep it uh, in theaters through Labor Day and beyond. Um, it was on Bob Hope. It was on the Richard Pryor show. It was on the Muppet show. And of course, it had the infamous... Um, variety show format star wars holiday special which aired once and only once <laughs> and never again in accordance with george's wishes however you have seen the past few years you've seen lego holiday special guardians of the Ga- galaxy holiday special you've seen endless jokes about the holiday special and now at theme parks you're seeing life day merchandise hasbro just put out a three and three quarter inch scale chewbacca life day action figure this past week and it's sold out um so the floodgates are opening in terms of how they're able to talk and merchandise the holiday special. And I think they're accepting the fact that it is become part of pop culture history. So this is a really artful look at it. It doesn't have a mean bone in its body. This film, it's very straightforward and done with a lot of love. Um, It didn't work. It didn't connect. That's why we haven't seen it again. It was a strange anomaly in star Wars history that took place in between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back when Lucasfilm wasn't a fully formed entity and when Star Wars' identity wasn't fully cemented in the zeitgeist. Like, what what was Star Wars? It was a one-off phenomenon at that point. It wasn't what we know it to be. It wasn't this huge universe. So you could have Chewbacca putting his arm around Darth Vader in a commercial. Hmm. You could have, you know, Richard Pryor and all the aliens doing a skit. Like... It was anything to keep Star Wars relevant. It was what was greenlit. And in that flurry of approvals came the holiday special. And I think its failure had a large effect on George Lucas um, as a creative. He just didn't want people playing in his universe without him authorizing and controlling. I think that that changes the, the direction Lucasfilm goes with how Star Wars is handled moving forward. So there's a lot of interesting things explored in this documentary, but First and foremost, it's fun and it's funny. And it's got everybody, Pat Oswalt's in it, Seth Green, Weird Al Yankovic, Kevin Smith, Paul Shear, Taron Killam, legendary collectors like Steve Sansweet and Gus Lopez. And 
like I said, Pete Sears and Donny Osmond, and uh, it's the last appearance of Gilbert Gottfried. Bobcat Goldthwait is in it. So there's an interesting um, cast of people talking about this very strange moment in Star Wars history. And that's coming, like I said, December. So it, it's awesome. Um, you'll be able to rent it, buy it, and probably streaming next year. Yeah, no, that sounds really, really fun. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, so maybe just the last question. I, I heard you talk about how you'd like to do a sequel to Fanboys someday, so I'm just curious, what is the current status of, of that? How's that looking? You know what? The current status is the passion and the commitment are undiminished. Um, the same people would all want to do it, you know, writers, producers, me, actors. We'll, we'll revisit it at some point. It's complicated because... Obviously, things went on with the Weinstein Company. Um, Kevin Spacey, one of the producers. There's lots of things that have happened, and the Weinstein Company disappeared. You know, who then who owned the film and where it ends up, and who wants to do it, but who, which company where someone has to deal with can do a deal with another company that you know they don't want to do a deal with. So things are, but things are opened up again. So we'll see what happens. There's a lot of egos in the film business <laughs> and movies and entertainment would be a lot easier without ego. Um, it's an easy thing to say, but um, they would, I think, you know, beautiful things are created when people put their egos aside and they do what's best for the project or the story. Um, and you see that happen when, when people believe in the vision of something, they all get on board and they're like, I'm on for the ride. I'll do what you need. Da, da, da. Um, it's it's just hard because you know there is like the, the the property of fanboys itself is now exchanged hands a few times i'm not even sure who precisely owns it right now what if it's a bank or a studio or somebody <laughs> based on all these different you know uh who controls the underlying rights to it all for all that but i think it's all being i think it's opened up in a way where we could do something and like i said the desire is as strong as ever. Yeah, I mean, just given everything that's happened with Star Wars, it seems like it would be really interesting to revisit those characters and and see how they're uh, how totally. they're feeling. And how everything. fandom has changed. Fandom's changed completely since the movie set in 1998. Back then, it was Star Wars and Star Trek. Now it's everything. Harry Potter didn't exist. Then. Lord of the Rings wasn't you know a big franchise. They didn't have all these things. You know, Transformers weren't turned into movies. These characters would have a comment on. <laughs> on all of the, the 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 explosion of nerd culture that's happened in the past twenty something years, um, so it would it would have to put all that into context too. You know, we'd be we'd be entering a world where Star Wars isn't the dominant franchise like it it should be. It's <laughs> just one of several. And um, how do they feel about that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. If that ever happens, uh, definitely, I would be really excited about that. Uh, we are all out of time. So, um, uh, Kyle, do you have any just any other final thoughts or uh, any other projects you want to let people know about? No, I mean, uh, stay, stay tuned for details about the D&D 50th doc and the holiday special um, doc. All that's on a, info is going to be on the disturbance of the force dot com, the website. And you know, the book stuff is great. We On November, uh, end of November, we have a special edition of Lore and Legends coming, uh, which is exquisitely produced. It's got a dice tray. It's got a limited edition dice. It's got a entire map of the Forgotten Realms and beyond um, and more. And it's a it, different cover, slipcase. It's fantastic. Um, so that is coming the end of uh, November, which we're very excited about. Um, and there is the Heroes Feast cooking show. So if you're a fan of Heroes Feast and Heroes Feast flavors of the multiverse, um, Hasbro has put out a Heroes Feast TV show, 20 episodes, one hour long, lots of D&D luminaries. Um, myself and the co-authors are in all the episodes distributing lore uh, throughout the 20 episodes. We also guest star, I believe it's episode three that we're in the whole episode. Uh, that was awesome and surreal. So if you're a fan of cooking shows, if you're a fan of Dungeons and Dragons, if you're a fan of Heroes Feast, it's tremendous fun. Um, and that's also coming November. I think it's on Amazon Freebie. It's on Plex. There's different ways to watch it. 
Uh, it's part of D&D Adventurers, which is um, a fast channel they're doing with 100 hours of D&D related content. And you can watch the old animated show there, things like that. So if you're a D&D fan, you probably want to find that network anyway and check it out. But Heroes Feast is anchoring that, and that is awesome. So it's great to see the Heroes Feast experience keep growing, and we should have more happening in that world too next year and beyond. Yeah, it's just so mind-blowing for me, as I said, as someone who uh, they wouldn't let us play D&D in high school, and now there's a D&D cooking show. It's like whoever would have uh, ever would have imagined that. Yeah, it's it's surreal. It's cool. Great hosts. Um, and like I said, lots of fun guest stars. Yeah. Uh, all right, so why don't we wrap things up there? So we've been speaking with Kyle Newman about his new book, Lauren Legends. So Kyle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great talk. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Kyle Newman for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.